Hi, I just threw out an, an amusing anecdote about uh, Michael Lewis. And Michael Lewis, who wrote Liar's Poker, um, and who used to work for a, an investment bank, uh, at one point in his life, probably about 30, 40 years ago, attended the London School of Economics. And during his time in London, Lewis had the opportunity to uh, participate in the NHS um, as a user. And he found out that the machines they were using there uh, to diagnose were light years behind the United States. And so he figured out that he could, you know, sort of do a lot of research into e either advanced imaging or some sort of scientific medical background, and then write articles about these sorts of things as his way of breaking in to the world of journalism. And one of his jokes, he's a very funny writer, which is why more people, more people read him um, than a lot of other writers who also discuss economics. And he was saying that it's, it's sort of like the difference between the difference between New Orleans, uh, you know, medical facilities and technology, and the NHS, which is publicly funded in the UK, uh, was you know if you brought some if you brought the NHS doctors an American invention, uh, an American medical um, you know hardware, uh, they would look at it as if it were if, as if it were magic. And what, what would explain that gap? Um, and of course, he, in, in his mind, he was simply trying to learn more about you know, the science behind it so that he could make it accessible uh, to more people. What I want to talk about today is why that gap existed. Um, and so a lot of people, a lot of conventional thinkers would say, well, it's the bankruptcy code, right? Um, you know, you have a situation where you can take more risks if you have an idea, because if your venture does not pan out, you declare bankruptcy, you start over. That's true. Uh, that's part of it. The second uh, item, of course, would be just the venture capital. Uh, this idea that innovation is best done under a model of public-private partnership, where, you know, the venture capitalists, rather than just big banks, which tend to be more conservative, or at least used to be, uh, before derivatives took over, um, and trading desks, you know, became uh, a little bit more unpredictable. The idea behind venture capital is that you had people that were willing to, at least, especially in a low interest rate environment, um, use money to innovate and to provide jobs based on that innovation, uh, in exchange, of course, for a, a premium on uh, the potential for a return, uh, which in some cases, you know, would be over 10,000%, uh, which of course, you know, means that you, know, you would have to try to invest in a hundred different things with the idea of one of those hundred things, a um, hundred opportunities or businesses being the home run um, or, you know, or so on, or the whole in one. Now, what, what's, what people, most people will give you those two answers. If you ask an academic or an economic student, they would give you the venture capital system. Um, and, and that, by the way, is what people mean when they, when they talk, talk about capitalism, they're talking about this partnership between the public and the private uh, that facilitates innovation, um, as opposed to only a central organization, like a central bank, which then links up to, you know, presumably private banks, a few of them, and then dictates innovation based on its public policy goals. Uh, and so when you look at it that way, that's true. But again, it misses the big picture. You've got the bankruptcy code, which facilitates risk taking. And then you've got the venture capital uh, world, which fa also facilitates innovation. Put those two together. And a lot of people would call that capitalism. Um, but of course, you're missing something here, which is the university system. Where, where do ideas come from? In reality, the bankruptcy code and the VC system wouldn't do you much good unless you had the talent from all, all over the world coming and collaborating here. And you notice a lot of the companies that are founded in Silicon Valley have Stanford you know, nearby, and, and that's how Google came about. And Google, of course, was founded by Larry Page, uh, a very Anglo name, but also Sergey Brin, a Russian name, which indicates that he's, the ch he's at least at some point in time, there was immigration involved from Russia, which did not have presumably this sort of public-private pu partnership model. Uh, otherwise, you would suspect that it would have, have either kept you know, Sergey Brin's ancestors, um, or at least, you know, try, tried to bring them back if he did end up going to Stanford, um, and, or his parents, and so on. Now, what, what, is, what is interesting about the, this system is that, first of all, you can see that you have to have collaboration between the public and the private. 
um, not only just not only in terms of innovation, in terms of setting policy, but also in terms of attracting people from all over the world, getting that talent from all over, all over the world. So that's number one. Number two, the other scenario, the other part that's missing in the conventional analysis, other than world class universities, they can they can cluster talent from all over the world is this idea of debt. Empires function on debt, and people forget about that. Uh, most people think debt is death, is anathema, they're, they're anti-debt, and justifiably so. But what people don't realize is that debt in the U.S. within this capitalistic model is used to further a monopoly. And that's how technology, and some, some, some businesses are better at creating monopolies than others. And Google, obviously, is a de facto or natural monopoly. Nobody wants to use Bing. Uh, nobody wants, I mean, even Wolfram. Uh, these, there, are, there is competition, but not really. Uh, simply because the gap in, um, in talent, essentially the product of that talent, is so wide. So you have a situation where that public-private partnership then calls in, you know, and it doesn't have to be Stanford. It's, 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 I know it's, it seems like a poor example because it's a private university, um, but in reality, of course, private universities rely on funding from the government through student loans that are issued and guaranteed or guaranteed uh, by, uh, by the U.S. government. Now, that's not always true. Uh, Stanford has an endowment that's massive, like many places, so it may not, it may be able to give free tuition to almost anybody on its campus. Uh, so, you know, that, that model doesn't quite work perfectly, um, but you can see how it would work if it's UC Berkeley or a lot of what's what are called the public Ivies. Um, and, you know, you actually wonder why you don't have more of that incubation happening at state schools. And then once again, that goes down to talent. A, a famous school like a UC Berkeley or a Stanford would probably be able to attract people from all over the world easier, more easily than a, even an equivalent school with perfectly good professors like Cal Poly. Um, which is nearby, which is somewhat nearby, uh, Stanford and UC Berkeley. Huh. So, so you, when you c consider all these things in context, if you look at debt in the same way that Peter Thiel looks at debt, which is you know the idea, well, he doesn't actually mention debt as part of his, you know, as part of his um, in, in his book, but he does say that ultimately all business is is, try is is trying to generate a monopoly because competition is bad for business; it's bad for profits. And the way that you do that in practice is you have debt that either buys out your competition, you have what's called lawfare, um, a legal warfare, which essentially you know, sues your, your competitors, um, you know, forcing them to spend money that would, that would otherwise be used on innovation, on lawyers, and other sort of extractive um, actions or, or areas, and so on. So the one thing you understand is that why is that possible? If other places did that, other countries and other universities and other, you know, um, bankruptcy systems, uh, you could see very quickly how the banking system in many other countries that are perhaps smaller and less robust uh, would actually fail. You would have a banking failure, and that happened in the U.S. as well, which would then cause a depression, which would, uh, which, which would then, depending on how globalized the economy was and how much external debt was held in a foreign currency, would, would cause a, a collapse. Um, and you can, it would cause at least massive inflation. Uh, and so on. Now, people tend to forget that. And, and the point is that if you're an empire, your goal is to get your currency to be the most, to be liquid all over the world. And the way you do that in, today is based on oil. Uh, and in, in many cases, food products, um, and like soybeans and so on. Um, so what ends up happening in coffee, and what ends up, ends up happening within this dynamic, within, within this framework, is that you know, debt becomes the medium, becomes an accepted part, part of a culture of the current way of capitalism because it's used to project power. It's used to, number one, wipe out competition, especially from foreign sources that are not allied with you. In other words, are not in debt to you based on your currency, thereby creating a monopoly. Or not, it doesn't look like a monopoly because the names are different. You have products coming in from South South Korea, uh, you have products coming in from a lot of other countries uh, that are, but all Canada, all those countries are allies within a legal framework. 
That's why they don't have pay, or at least within a trade agreement. And if you notice when you go down in the store, you don't, if, if, depending on where you are, you don't see products on those shelves from countries that are not aligned or in debt with your, with your, with your central government. So you, if you're in the U.S., despite Turkey being an ally, you don't actually see a lot of Turkish products on your shelves. That's weird. Um, which is particularly strange because the Turk, the Turks are, at least they used to be very good at things that are quite, that are really interesting, like, uh, shipbuilding, like yachts. Um, I mean, they're actually quite advanced when it comes to, uh, some parts, or the, at least they used to be in some parts of technology, um, or hardware. Now, if, if you consider it within that paradigm, this economic structure, you know, and you, when you go to the grocery store, you know, you're not expecting, depending on where that currency, who's using your currency or who owes you money in your currency um, and the foundation of that, you won't see, for example, in the U.S., you won't see a lot of products coming in from Russia. That's That, again, is odd. You'll see more products coming in from other countries. You'll see vodka coming in from probably a lot of other places, but not necessarily as many from Russia. Um, or just anything, really. You won't see... A lot of cars, I mean, and, and you may and you may not want to. You won't even see Chinese cars now. If you go to Southeast Asia, where um, you know the Chinese do have more investments, um, well, I don't know if they have more investments, but the, but there's more of that currency usage. There's more of that debt. There's more of that relationship, economic relationship, uh, due to ASEAN and, and other factors. You'll see Chinese cars. I mean, if, I, I don't think I've seen a single Chinese car anywhere in the United States, uh, despite uh, an obviously an obvious sort of manufacturing supply chain situation though that's interlinked, at least as of today. So when you consider debt, why the United States and empires have so much of it, you can see that debt is used along with tariffs and sanctions in order to facilitate uh, a monopoly in certain products that, are th that then take over the world through your exports. That includes Google, Facebook, a lot of these things are now digital. Um, that includes almost, and, and that includes almost everything, right? It, it, and to the extent that, you know, you're able to, you know, you know, to the extent that you're able to project your power, that's all done through currency and economics and trade. And the goal of that debt is to buy out your competition. That's that's the best case scenario. And then because you're, you're spending that money, uh, you know, you're able to create a dominant position. You're able to get the best talent from all over, all over the world to come in and work for you. Um, especially if it's digital, you can get people from all over the world, uh, you know, fairly, fairly easily, as opposed to having to deal with immigration. And what you'll notice is that, you know, this system is designed to create a leader worldwide, and it's designed, it's, it's based on debt. And if it's, in some cases, you know, it's based on debt and it's obviously based on laws. Uh, otherwise, Huawei would be in a position where it could use its, its, its cash and it's, repu and it's just its reputation to come in and to any country it wanted to. And that's obviously not the case because of, because of that dynamic we just talked about, about that alignment, about why you don't see, you know, products from all over the world on your shelves at your grocery store or at Target or at Walmart. Uh, even though, you know, and, and Walmart might be a good example because it does actually have products from all, all over the world to the extent that it has a, a store or a subsidiary in a foreign country. So if you wanted to get like La La Milk from Mexico, which is fantastic, especially the protein version of it, uh, they do have it. You just have to go to a super center and get it. That's because they have a supply chain um, and they're able to, you know, they have that trade between a country that's aligned with their supply chain and their objectives. And of course, you know, once again, you see how they're projecting power. That debt allows them to uh, project power by going into Mexico and becoming the de facto place to be uh, or to buy from. And they're able to do that because not only is it the, if, if the currency wasn't strong, you wouldn't, you know, if, it, if it wasn't liquid, it, you could have, you wouldn't be able to go into another country and say, all right, well, let me open up a store. They would be like, okay, well, you know, you need to take out a loan from us and the Mexican peso, and then maybe we'll consider it. But if you have a strong currency, you actually tell them, well, we want to build, you know, we want, you know, we'll, we'll, you want, we want your government to go in debt to us. Uh, to buy either our oil or to have some sort of supply chain that makes it easier for us to set up shop uh, to facilitate that supply chain, that infrastructure. Uh, and we want trade to go back and forth and that way we can, you can make things for us. We can figure out what your strengths are. Um, and in some cases it's, it's designed, you know, this country over here, this, this area does 
you know, farming better will make that the, the farming exports base or this country makes cars better will make that the car, you know, this other base, this country, this place does, you know, um, chocolates better or whatever it is, whatever, whatever you can, whatever that competitive advantage uh, could be. And once again, you see how all this is designed in a way to make your currency the, the de facto world standard. And that's the basis for strength. Even if you have, if you don't have those universities, you don't get that talent, you don't, you're not, and then there's, no, there's no, really no point in having so much debt uh, because the whole point is to, to create that leader. And, you know, the way you do that is by having your currency be the medium of exchange as opposed to somebody else. Now you can see how within this framework, Number one, you can see why debt has become normalized. If the country goes in debt, it's natural for the citizens to go in debt, uh, even for essential items. And that's, in fact, one of the reasons why the United States has such a cavalier attitude towards personal debt, more so than almost any, any other country in the world. Um, and that's, again, one of the reasons that's how people project power. Not so much individuals, um, but you can see, again, that the debt, once it's there, has to be paid off, or at least the interest has to be paid off. And so, as a result, you're in a position where, you know, you are trying to reduce that debt once you, you know, once you have that leadership position by exporting it, because you're just, you're not going to be able to sell whatever it is only in your country. And furthermore, you're not going to have your currency be the medium of, medium of exchange, um, you know, if, it's only, if you only sell within your own country. So, you're able to, you know, essentially create a worldwide economic model that f flows through you and then and then flows through your infrastructure, physical and digital, whether it's transfer transfer payments, uh, whatever it is, um, you can, you know, you have that infrastructure in place based on that currency. And this is no small thing. Uh, JP Morgan transfers about, and, and this, is, this is a true number, from the CEO in 2017, transfers about $6 trillion with a T, a day, digitally. Of course, that's worldwide. Now, apparently, 40% of those are between JP Morgan accounts. So if you're Caterpillar, um, you know, Mexico, uh, a lot of it might be simple. In, in the Caterpillar USA, you might have a, you know, JP Morgan account in both countries. And then so you're just transferring from one account to another account. That's where a lot of that 40%, that's where 40% of the transactions come from. But again, that's based on this idea that, you know, in order to have that infrastructure in place, JP Morgan spends about $9 billion a year on um, technology, a lot of which is obviously security. So you can see how you get, become the market leader, you, in part based on your currency and the infrastructure surrounding that currency and the transfer mechanisms involved, which then allow you to pass laws like tariffs or enforce them through your military and so on, uh, through sanctions, etc. And what's what I, I think that people tend to forget that's why debt rules, debt has become so ubiquitous. And, you know, that's also why, in, you know, because of that, because of debt, that's also why war is also common. Because war in many cases is, you know, when you go to war, if you win, what ends up happening, usually you win based on having superior technology, what, you know, which is, of course, again, done based on debt uh, to create a leadership position based on having the best product. And so war in many cases happens because this other country over there doesn't, doesn't want to use your standards. You have to open up, you know, it doesn't want to open up its markets to you, at least not on terms that are favorable favorable to you. And it may not want to buy your bonds or it may want you, you know, it may, it may want a technology transfer that might be too onerous for you. Um, and so you can see how there's, there's, there's having your currency be the worldwide standard, you know, Essentially, it's, it's something that, that's a cycle. You spend currency to become the leader. That currency then, you know, you project your power and then you keep going in debt in order to, you know, maintain that leadership position. Um, and what, what, what happens in this case is, you know, in some cases, you end up going to war because somebody's not on the same standard, not on the same currency, not on the same infrastructure. And the only way you can expand your markets is by going to war and then putting that country in debt in your currency. And that's a very simplistic way of looking at war. But you can see how not having the same currency, not having the same infrastructure, 
can result in a lot of misunderstandings, right? Like you don't have an incentive to learn the other person's language, which means you don't have an incentive to, you know, to understand that person's culture, uh, at least not on, on any significant scale. And it's the fact it's the same thing, vice versa. That also leaves you open to uh, misinformation. If you don't have anybody nearby that speaks the other country's language, you know, whatever they say can be manipulated or taken out of context much more easily. Uh, and as opposed to, you know, if you have an interview with Vincente Fox of Mexico, he speaks both Spanish and, and English fluently, obviously, you know, and so, you know, it's very difficult to manipulate what he says. But if you have somebody that doesn't have that exchange program with the universities, at least in some scale, very difficult to learn to speak a language fluently unless you have that, that those exchange programs, or at least some cultural um, opportunities that are based on, uh, um, that are based on, you know, having a transfer of people uh, at some point, especially young people that are more, that are probably more malleable, um, just linguistically as well as other, ideologically. Uh, I mean, you know, this happens all over the world. I mean, the, you know, you, you know it doesn't, it's not a guarantee. One of the executives or the, the, politics, the top political leaders in Iran studied in Scotland. Uh, speaks, I was, who speaks, speaks fluent English? Uh, but you probably have never heard of him. Uh, you never heard anything he has to say. Uh, and again, that, so it's not a guarantee, uh, but you know, you can see how the reason that you're able to see certain products on your shelves from certain countries, the reason that you're able to have an opinion about certain leaders in other countries is oftentimes based on this infrastructure that's designed around a marketing premise to facilitate countries aligned alignments to facilitate countries, you know, accepting each other's economic systems and debt and infrastructure. In the same way that JP Morgan has an easier time when you know, if in 40% of his transactions being between the same technology, essentially the same, you know, intra transfer the same companies in some cases. Uh, well, not the same companies, but you can see how if everyone has a JP Morgan account, you know, it's much easier because you have one security standard, you have one, in many cases, even if you have, um, even, even if you don't have the same language, it's not difficult to create or hire somebody that will facilitate that. And that, again, creates jobs and so on. And so the debt is a method by which empires try to expand their influence through accomplishing a leadership position within a certain field and then using that leadership position in order to export products. And if you have to buy oil in US dollars, well, you can't, no one's, it's possible to get just an oil tanker to come over, but if you're gonna be on that journey anyway, why not come, out, come in with Nikes and Coca-Cola as well? And if you're another country and, and, you're, and you can see how, again, this creates the groundwork for war, because if you, know, if, if you don't have, if you have oil, for example, uh, you don't need to buy anything from that country over there, right? Don't need to use that person's currency. So that again facilitates misunderstanding. Maybe you don't want, you know, it, it makes it harder to accept the consumer, you know, sort of line, the trickle down that comes from the investments that are made and facilitated by debt. And again, that's one of the reasons why uh, countries with oil are in many cases uh, mired in war because if you're not on that system, it's very difficult to have a, a, any economic relationship, um, or at least, which, or at least of any meaningful sort, which then leads into, which then makes it harder to have a cultural relationship, which then breeds misinformation or the grounds for misinformation, and and a lot of other issues that then lead to that can escalate into things like sanctions and tariffs, which then can escalate further um, into into war. So. I think that, that I think that was my point is that you know a lot of people don't understand why there's so much debt. A lot of people don't understand that you know there is a uh, a reason, a rhyme and reason for that. Um, and you know ultimately it's it's based on currency and the empire and any empire attempting to make its currency the most liquid all over the world in order to in order to use and facilitate physical transfers usually physical transfers of products and also these days the digital infrastructure that's necessary to transport, um, you know, the, the, what should be top level products. Um, and of course, you know, to also take that money and then invest it back into the Navy or the military to continue innovating and to continue to stay ahead. Now you can see how this doesn't always work out. 
You can also understand other things like, how is it that Donald Trump became the president of the United States? The answer is that. Uh, and, and it doesn't mean in law as well. It doesn't, you don't necessarily, the problem with this dynamic is that you, at some point marketing becomes, which is obviously easier because of the cultural understandings and facilitation of, you know, exchanges, uh, social exchanges um, and media and so on. You, you have a situation where marketing can get ahead of itself in the same way that, you know, the marketing department within any company can get ahead of itself and then, you know, sell something that doesn't match the actual products that the engineers are working on in a different department. Uh, and the worst case scenario of this is obviously Theranos or, or, or any kind of fraud or any, any, any kind of allegedly fraudulent enterprise. Uh, it's basically, the marketing has gotten ahead of the engineers or the scientists or the actual product managers um, or, you know, within that company. It's the same way in countries. The same dynamic can happen in, uh, you know, the, in public and private organizations. So one of the reasons that you know, one of the reasons is once you open up that, that conduit, both digital and physical, you don't, at some point, you don't necessarily need to have the best product to get your products into another country. Um, you, you, it just has to be a product. And, you know, you've got all these lines open that allow you to ship anything, really. And, you know, you don't necessarily have to be the leader in some cases. You just have to have the connections, especially politically or within certain ship businesses. And you can get those connections based on debt. In order, in order to export something. And that shouldn't happen. That's, that is why capitalism um, has become, in some circles, um, disfavored. Um, it, you know, simply because if you are in a position where you're not getting, getting the best products and you're still going in debt, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, or if you're in a position where, you know, and, and actually this is where Amazon comes in. You know, um, if, if it's, it's hard to be anti-capitalist um, as a user of Amazon especially if you travel and you don't have access to Amazon, uh, simply because you're, you're restricted to what you, what's nearby. Uh, usually, if you travel, you're not going to have a car. If you're in a developed country, you might have public transportation. Uh, but for the most part, if you have to stay a long time in a place, the advantages of having the, the advantages of, of, of capitalism cross-border become very obvious. And of course, Amazon doesn't always make money on the products that it sells. In some cases, it might lose money thereby subjecting it to antitrust issues. But the reason it's able to do that is because it's got, it's, it's, real, it's really a technology company today. It's got a data company. And it's also a supply company and a shipping company. Um, that's where it gets its sources. And, and the same dynamic applies to Amazon. Not everything you buy online, especially from a third party seller, is going to be good. Now, if you happen to be in a country where you have a particularly high incidence of you know, fraudsters on Amazon, you're not gonna like capitalism. But if you are in a country where you have established players, uh, you know, and then you're probably going to like capitalism. So a lot of that, again, goes back to you, what we just talked about is that supply chain um, and trying to get the best products noticed. And the problem is with advertising is that you don't have to have the best product. You just, in many cases, you just have to have the best advertising or the most um, money in the advertising budget. So, which then leads to facilitates disinformation and fake news. Uh, which is a form of marketing. Now, you can see that within this paradigm, you can try to under, you can actually understand a lot of what goes on around you. And the question is, is there a better model? And I have some ideas about that, but you know, a, you know, a lot of it actually comes down to Singapore. You, you would want you know a small country like a Singapore, um, which is dependent on food and water from another country, somewhat. Uh, to be in charge of the financial infrastructure for that region, uh, because of, a, of, a, of its small size, and you know it, it can't quite be in its dependence on uh, on water, at least from another country, it can't become too arrogant. It has to be diplomatic. So you can see how that model might, and, and the chances of going to war here are, are zero. Uh, the only time you know, LKY, the founder of Singapore, uh, only mentioned war to the extent that you know if Malaysia cut off water to Singapore. That was the only time I've heard LKY talk about war. So in, real, in, in realistically speaking, uh, we're dealing with a 0% chance of war. And there's no oil in Singapore, right? But it's not going out there and trying to, you know, do a coup in, in some foreign country. And again, the reason for that is based on its size and it's based on its, and its dependency on a neighbor for essential, for food and water. Not, not necessarily food anymore, but certainly water. 
Now, that could be a model. Uh, you could export that, and you know, it would, you know that that's something I look into. Uh, right now, if J.P. Morgan is, is in every country, uh, it's, it's a U.S. business. You have a, a lack of inf you have basically you have a lack of trans you know, transparency because um, the tax code facilitates, uh, in many cases, a lack of transparency um, that is then facilitated by a, a banks or a banks lawyers or just a legal system. And so when you look at this entire, you know, this is worldwide. In Singapore, I tried to look up one of the companies that's listed listed here. It it was a flowchart that looked like uh, a a, a, geno, a gene, gene, genealogical chart uh, of you know a, a, of a king in in, in the UK. Uh, it had branches going out this way, this way, this way, and then you had to go over here. And those were all, there's this Hong Kong subsidiary over here. And then you go to over here to the Singapore branch, and then you've got another one down here, and you you know it's it, it, it's it's insane. In order to facilitate, really, like in order to minimize fraud and so on, you actually have to have a transparent legal system that allows you to regulate uh, a lot of these businesses that are on these platforms, uh, so that you don't have debt coming in, and 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 marketing that goes along with the debt, overwhelming uh, the system. And the only way to do that within is, is to reform the tax code worldwide, and also to, ref to 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 reform transparency. In other words, if you have a tax code that does not facilitate transparency um, into actors, you you not only have money laundering uh, potential, but you just you just have a, a difficulty with overall regulation. If you don't know who's operating within your country because of this complex tax system, uh, tax code that that allows people to hide behind shell. Or, or not even shell entities, just multiple, so many entities that there's no way to, uh, for a government lawyer to issue subpoenas to figure out what's going on in the event of a complaint. Uh, you also have a potential for just simply local bankruptcies that don't, uh, that don't affect the parent company. Uh, a, a clear example of that would be the Catholic Church. If you have a billion dollar judgment against the Catholic Church for uh, covering up child molestation or negligence, uh, if it's structured legally in a way that only the local diocese can go bankrupt, but it never really affects the central um, structure in Rome or the Holy See uh, in Italy. Uh, you have a system where the, the opportunities for further uh, negligence are still there. There's been no fundamental change because of that, that structure. And my point is the structure doesn't have to be that way, but as long as the structure and the tax code are not transparent, or do not facilitate transparency, it will you will, we will continue making the same mistakes. And people will blame things like capitalism, or they will blame corporations, or they will do blame CEOs or politicians. Um, and this will continue uh, as long as people don't, people don't understand the foundation of the current economic structure system, which is debt, leadership, uh, universities, essentially talent, any way you can get talent. Which is, and the way easily, you, you, can, you can get talent by paying for it, and by attracting people to come in. Um, uh, but you know, that's all based on your currency being the unit of exchange that gives you an advantage against other countries based on that digital infrastructure that allows the transfer of, of that currency uh, in order for it to be an accepted medium of exchange worldwide, which then is a, is a cycle. It's a, it's a self-perpetuating cycle. One country accepts it, then another country accepts it. Eventually, it tends to take over, which and that's all the result of having debt uh, that allows you to invest in talent in order to maintain a leadership pole position. But that, of course, can go awry if debt becomes too easily available. This is what Stanley Druckenmiller talks about, the investor. Uh, he says that the, the capitalism only works if there's a hurdle, a hurdle rate um, for investment. In other words, if interest rates are zero, bad money overwhelms good money. Uh, you know, and you know, you, you and, and ultimately it all goes to pot. It all just dis disintegrates because you don't have to make careful decisions about where you invest your money if it's too easy easy to get access to money from a central bank or a private bank. We saw that in two thousand eight and two thousand nine. Um, and so these all these these are all fairly complicated issues. But I hope I've tried to, you know, I've tried to sort of you know, analyze it so that we can focus on the tax code because. Without reforming the tax code and the legal code, that it, the tax code is a, is a law. Uh, without reforming that, um, we're never going to have proper the ability of governments to regulate, and that ends up in a position where the governments become weak. Uh, this has happened before because governments tend to be local and domestic, um, and when they're not, uh, well, well, the entity that's that's not local and domestic 
uh, will be the military. And that's why in so many countries you have people that are, they have, it's either a military takeover, um, like in Iraq, or you have you know, a lot of politicians wearing military garb. Um, you know, a lot of that has, is, you know, until that, that dynamic gets fixed, you're going to have what Eisenhower called the military industrial complex, um, where ultimately politicians are just figureheads uh, for policy that's really made by uh, military competence. And that, of course, presents a whole set of other problems, uh, that, and many of which we see today based on the amount of war that continues um, that has happened up to now, from 19, 1945 all the way to now. Um, and a lot of that, again, is to open markets in order to maintain that debt, that, that economic model. And people will blame the economic model but what's really, what they really should blame is the lack of transparency, the, the unfortunate um, inability, of, inability of politicians to understand the dyna dynamic, thereby making it very difficult to regulate it, which is something I still, still don't understand. Um, you know, we know we have a shadow banking problem. We know we have you know, a tax code problem. We know we have a lack of transparency. Uh, we've, we've all, we all know about the Panama Papers. Uh, we, some of us have seen the movie with, with Meryl Streep or Antonio Banderas called The Laundromat. Um, we know these things are happening and yet nobody can fix it. And of course, the answer to that is what I think uh, Misha Glennie talked about in his book, McMafia, is that everybody wants regulation except to the extent that their own opportunities for growth are hindered. So everyone wants regulation, but on the other guy, not, not on themselves. The only way to fix this is global cooperation with the tax code. Until that that gets fixed, the only international entity that is truly international won't be the individual. <clears throat> certainly, won't be a, a lawyer uh, that's only been trained in the United States under American laws um, within a globalized economy. The control will be based on different militaries um, and what the navies ship to each other. I don't know. Hopefully, we can figure out a way to fix it, but it all goes down to the. It all essentially will take you back to a tax code, or at least a, the creation of a separate tax code for global, for banks and insurance companies um, that, that are involved in transnational transactions.